Hi everyone, welcome back to our reading group. Today we're picking up with section 2.5. We're ready to charge full speed ahead. I'm going to more or less skip 2.4. Uh, I encourage you guys to take a look at it if there's anything that I say today that's not clear to you. But mostly 2.4 is about um, injective limits or inductive limits in the category of sets. And we sort of spent a lot of time talking about this stuff already. We saw a, whole, a wealth of examples. Uh, and most of the propositions in that section are either modest generalizations of things we've already seen or stuff that just really felt clear to me after everything we've already said. So I thought it wise for the sake of, uh, shall we say, brevity, moving along and getting into the next section. And this is about cofinal functors, which is a notion that I'd never seen before. Um, so certainly I feel compelled to make such a, a video on this topic, if only because it's new to me which suggests it very well might be new to many of you. So whenever we have a new topic, we always start with our definition. And we call a functor phi, uh, let's make it j to i, because that's what the notation always seems to be, is called cofinal uh, if the category j upper i is connected. And remember that this category j upper i is the category where the objects are maps from i um, to 5j. And so these are things that live inside of i in spite of the notation. Um, and the objects, of course, are then uh, all commutative triangles because everything is out of little i. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I said it's connected, but I didn't quantify over i. So of course, it should be connected for every i. And there's a dual notion which Kashiwara and Shapira call co-co-final um, because there's something else that's also called final. Um, but Lavert, for example, in his writings, calls the dual notion just final. And I'm going to do that. I'm going to call the dual notion simply final. And this will be, of course, if j lower i is connected for all i. And this hopefully minor difference in notation, I'm sorry about that, doesn't cause us any trouble. Um, if we ever run into a situation where we have both uses of final running around at the same time, then I'll just be super clear if we come to it. Now, the reason for one such a notion, as far as I can gather, is that cofinal functors have nice properties that give, um, shall we say, compatibilities between limits and colimits, and of course these functors. So there's a big proposition in Kashiwara and Shapira, which I'll formulate now. I'm not going to prove the whole thing, partly because Kashiwara and Shapira don't even prove the whole thing. Um, of course, it's a, the following are equivalent. So first, Kashiwara and Shapira don't prove everything themselves. Second is a bunch of this stuff is not hard because they're just statements and the dual statements or sort of things that are clearly equivalent. And also there are six parts, so we're not going to do this. Um, but let me tell you what the six parts are, and then I'll explain the parts that are clear, and I'll explain the part that I want to elaborate on. So first, of course, phi is cofinal. Then for any i in i, um, hum over all the maps uh, i to j. Uh, sorry, that should be, that's not right, um, because those are in different categories. So what do I need here? Um, I regret this. Is a, I regret this typo. Um, what I want is uh, no. I don't want maps here at all. I just want to say for every uh, for every j. Um, oh, I see what's wrong here. That doesn't make sense. Ugh, I'm all messed up today. I'm sorry. I just gave a talk. For my final so I'm a little fried. I want the limit over all the j's hum in i. There we go. i 5j is a point. And we're sticking to this notation of the asterisk for points. Next we have uh, a pair for any beta i op to set then the natural map which takes the limit of beta to the limit of beta precomposed with phi should be a bijection for uh, 
for any C and any functor uh, beta I op to C, then there's a similar morphism now on the level of pre sheaves, which is limit uh, beta to limit beta compose phi op, and that's an isomorphism of pre sheaves. So this is just a sort of enhancement of what we just said. And now we have two more, and this is the analogous statement, but now with just I instead of I op, and we want the forward limits. Uh, oh, do I, I don't need to take phi op because category goes the right direction. And finally, six is the analogous statement. So this is a big proposition, but let's do ourselves a quick sanity check and make sense of this. So first, these implications are clear. One of them is simply a special case of the other. The other directions are applications of Yonida. And these pairs are saying the same thing. They're simply dual statements. So these are the same. So off the bat, what remains to be done is understanding one and two and how they relate to three and four and therefore also five and six. So the relationship between uh, two and these pairs is explained in Kashiwara and Shapira uh, completely cleanly. Um, but it's also possible something that they don't do is to give a direct proof of one is equivalent to two. And so I'm going to do that now because I don't like the argument that they give. They don't actually give a direct proof of this because they're trying to give a minimal proof. So they show like one implies one of the other ones, which implies one of the other ones, which implies two. And similarly, there's some annoying chain. Um, so I don't want to do that. What I want to do is tell you what important results we need from 2.4 to see why this is true, and then give a direct computational proof of this fact. So we'll start with a lemma. And this is one of those results from 2.4. Um, Maybe I'll say some words about the proof because it's not too hard. Um, so let's say I have two functors, f and g. f is from some c to some c prime, and g is c to some c double prime. So two different categories. And now I take a and b um, in c prime and c double prime, respectively. Objects. Then we have an isomorphism. Um, over those g's mapping to b. We take the limit of those g's mapping to b. Um, c prime a fx is the same thing as the limbs of the a's that map to fx in c double prime of gx and b. So notice the sort of symmetry in the lemma, right? What this is telling us is that there's a compatibility, so you can sort of see why this is an important result along the way to our proof, between these sort of relative constructions in the limit and what happens with the effects on the HOM sets. Um, I think I'll skip the proof of this. Um, it's not particularly difficult, just sort of for the sake of time. Um, if you don't think you can prove this yourself, then I invite you to check out the proof in Kashiwara and Shapira. Um, just to sort of give maybe a, a hint on, or an idea of the proof, what, we, what you need to do, in case you don't see how to do this, is construct a category J. Or they call it J, you can call it whatever you want. Which contains the data of both categories simultaneously. So it sort of contains both relative categories.
well, I guess maybe I should call them relative homes because I'm taking the limit over these guys. I don't really know what to call it. And show um, show this category uh, is isomorphic to what you want. In particular, uh, we'll call this guy C lower B. And also then uh, C A up. And this is not a tremendously difficult thing to do. So hopefully this hint suffices for you guys to crack this. But if not, then just check it out in Kashiwara and Shapira. It's not hard. Now, with this lemma, it's easy to prove a direct proof of one implies of one is equivalent to two. And the way that you do this is we have the following chain of equivalences or isomorphisms. We have J and J. Um, I five J. This is the thing that we're interested in. Well, these these objects. This is the same as those. Uh, oh, sorry, I forgot the limb. J and J I now hum and set of beta J to a point. which is in turn the same thing of uh, the beta j's which is pi zero j i so how does this work here so Beta, in previous videos I've called this k, I could have called this guy k. Again, this is the constant functor, taking value star, or point, whatever you like. Now, the key is in this first isomorphism, right? It's this guy. This is where we use the lemma. Because what happens is, I have my pair of uh, functors, I have phi, and I have beta, and I want to apply the previous lemma with this pair of functors. So I am getting this isomorphism between limits computed one way and limits computing in this other way, beta being set valued and phi being valued in these categories. Um, what this does is it moves the phi over um, to the first argument, and we're doing this in ji, so therefore we're dealing with j's, not with i's. Um, and then this becomes the isomorphism that you see here. So we're sort of using this uh, compatibility or transfer lemma, if you like, to get this isomorphism. Now, the second isomorphism, this is just by definition. What are the map, the set maps into the, the single point? Well, it's just everything, right? It's the only thing it can be. Um, so it's a collapse. Um, but on the other hand, then in Ji, if I take the limit over these guys, then what sorts of things are possible? Well, this is just telling us how many connected components there are uh, of the category. If that's not clear, well, first remember that we proved it in the case where the category is connected and you get a singleton in a previous uh, previous video. This was in lemma, this was like lemma 10 or 12 of 2.1. So in order to convince yourself that this is true, just think about what happens in the case where the category is disconnected. Like if I have two connected components, then my category, what, which once I'm taking pi zero, I'm thinking of it as like a graph. Then what I'm doing is I have my category with maybe several connected components, and the whole category is like this. And now I'm looking at a constant functor into sets. Well, how many ways can I do that? Well, this is exactly the same sort of thing as like in calculus or topology, right? Like I can pick a different constant for each of the connected components. And so those different values give more possibilities for um, how many choices there are. And so this limit is therefore the same thing as counting the number of connected components, which as a set is just pi zero of ji. So the takeaway from all this though, is that this actually implies our argument, or our equivalence. 
So let's go back and just remind ourselves what it says because it's been a little bit now. The first is that phi is cofinal, which says that um, pi zero of the category ji is connected, is, is a singleton because it's, well, it's, it's, if it's connected, it's a single thing. So then this tells us that this limb is a single point, but that's the statement two. Statement two in the proposition is for any i, that particular limit is a single point. And on the other hand, of course, if I assume it, then I go the other way. And so this computation forces these things to be equivalent to each other. So we, so we deduce as a corollary from this um, that cofinal functors preserve the number of connected components of a category. And that's the kind of thing that's pretty important when you're going to be dealing um, with, like, for example, localizations um, of a category. We're going to see this, I think, in the next chapter, so soon. Um, maybe a little longer. I forget. But soonish. Um, and the idea, of course, to see how this works is that I just apply this with the connected components to these constant functors. The cofinality tells us that the constant functor on one is the same as the pullback of the constant functor on the other. And so therefore, um, both these things are just pi zero by what we just said. And therefore, the number of connected components is counted. It's the same. I want to show one more proposition. This is another proposition that's not very hard. Sort of a corollary also of what we just said. And this will be it for today. This is another sort of compatibility thing that's useful. Um, and it basically just tells us how cofinal functors interact with each other. So three parts. The first is if phi and psi are both cofinal. Oh, sorry, I don't want I don't want the composition. I mean, I do, but not yet. Um, if I have two functors, both cofinal, so is their composition. Two, um, if the composition is cofinal, and so is the first one, or sorry, the second, um, mm, the first one. And so is the second. I got confused because morphisms get written left to right, but applied right to left. I'm too old to make this mistake. Finally, if phi is fully faithful and the composition is cofinal, then both the individual ones are. And this is a really easy proposition to prove also, sort of elegant for what we just did. The useful criterion is the bijectivity part of the above proposition. So the composition of two bijections, we know that's a bijection. And so um, that handles the first two just off the bat. Um, and for the third, um, you have to work the tiniest bit. What you should do is note that if j, if I have some j and j, and then I have uh, psi k to j, that k j, the category, is equivalent to k phi of j. And this category is connected because we know the composition is cofinal. But the catch is that that makes psi cofinal, um, and in turn that makes phi cofinal by the previous part. And this finishes us off. So a bit of a short video today. Um, this is not a very long section. Um, so I hope this has been enlightening to you guys and enjoyable. And I'll see you guys uh, in the next video where we'll pick up again with uh, 2.6, just plowing full speed ahead through chapter two. Take care, everyone.